If you were not here last week and you'd like to see the Christmas musical presented by the choir under the direction of Linda Yarbrough and our choir, you can go on our website, sunlakescommunitychurch.org, go to the sermon section, and there you will find the Christmas musical. And uh, they did a great job, and I appreciate so much. Usually, we take time to introduce give folk who are here for the first time the opportunity to introduce themselves and us to introduce our children and grandchildren. I know there are a number of children and grandchildren here this morning, and, um, and we haven't, we haven't uh, specifically greeted them, but we're really delighted to have you. Anytime we have anybody under 50 here, we're just delighted. <laughs> when I was here many years ago, anybody under 40 was welcome, but... Uh, Things have changed a bit since that point. But we are just really thrilled that you're here. And trust that uh, today and tomorrow that you'll be able to, uh, to celebrate uh, Christmas, not only with good food and uh, with presents, and I'm sure there'll be presents involved, but that you will remember, don't forget the season. Don't, remember, don't forget to remember what it's all about, why we're here and why we're celebrating uh, this season. It is not for the purpose of decorating trees and helping the merchants have a good bottom line at the end of the year, but it is to celebrate the coming of our Lord. And this morning, uh, the passage of scripture that uh, Doug read to you may be a little, seem a little out of sorts for Christmas. It doesn't have the traditional Christmas uh, words in it, but, uh, but uh, the Apostle Paul, he does not, he does not speak of shepherds and, and stars and angels and, and mangers. But I think when he wrote the Galatian Christians, he had, if I can use the term, the Bethlehem event. I think he had that Bethlehem event in mind when he wrote to the Galatians. And he points out the purpose for the coming of our Savior, the purpose uh, for Christmas. And I'd like to address that for just a few moments this morning, if you allow me. I suggest to you that one of the reasons that Paul wrote to the Galatians in the first place was to affirm God's faithfulness, to affirm his faithfulness. God had uh, promised long ago that he would send a Messiah, he would send a Savior, and, uh, and, 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 he, had, and he kept his word. He kept his word then, he kept, keeps his word now, and he will keep his word in the future. And I think he wanted the Galatians. Now, these are people that had come to Christ. They came out of paganism. They did not necessarily know all of the history, all of the prophecies out of Israel's history. But he wanted them to know that God was faithful. Paul had preached to them that God would forgive their sins if they would believe and trust in Jesus Christ. And so he's reminding them of the faithfulness of God. What he has said he would do, he has indeed done. And the relationship that, that they had and we have with God through Jesus Christ is a result of him keeping his promises. The second reason, I think, that he wrote to the, to the Galatians was to encourage them to pray. To pray. To pray for their friends, to pray for their neighbors, to pray for their family members, to pray for their salvation. And to pray for any other need that they might have. Israel had prayed for centuries for a Messiah to come. He did not come in the form that they anticipated. He did not come looking like they had hoped he would look, riding a stallion and with his, his sword slashing and Roman soldiers falling left and right. Did not come the way they expected him to come, but he, indi he indeed did come. And so, so Paul is wanting them and us to remember, pray, don't, don't give up. Sam Nadler that was here a few weeks ago, our Jewish gentleman that came and spoke to us, one of the things that I remember him saying was that it's always too early to quit. It's always too early to quit. And so if you've been praying for your son or your daughter or your children or your husband or your, somebody, you've been praying for years, it's too early to quit. It's too early to quit. I remember reading a book years ago, and uh, it had to do with uh, George Mueller, who was a, a man who lived by prayer. And he had a brother who, he was in Wales. His brother lived in Canada. And God told him, if you'll pray for your brother every day, I will save him. Twenty-five years later, the brother came to know the Lord. 
So it's always too early for us to quit praying. So Paul wanted them to know God keeps his promise and he also wanted them to know that it's too early to quit praying, keep on praying. The words that Paul uh, wrote to these people are, are maybe not that familiar to you. So I'd like to read them to you with, with just some insight into it. But when the time had fully come, one translation says when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to what purpose? What did he, why did he send his son? To redeem those under the law. And what is the benefits of that? That we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into the hearts, into our hearts. The spirit who calls out Abba, Father. So you're no longer slaves, but sons. And since you are sons, God has made you also an heir. That's the reason for the season. That's the purpose for Christmas. That God sent his son. He sent his son to redeem. He sent his son so that we might have a relationship with him. That we might have no, 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 no other religion that I'm aware of. Do individuals worship their particular God with the idea that they can have a personal relationship with their God? The scripture tells us that if Christ is in us and the spirit of God has entered our heart, we are in relationship with the sovereign of the universe. That's kind of exciting, folks. And it's a gift that God has given us that we can be in relationship with him. So what do I see? What do I see as a purpose for the Bethlehem event out of Paul's writing here? Well, first of all, I think we see God's perfect control over events and history. Perfect control in the fullness of time or when the time had fully come, God acted. He spoke through Isaiah some 700 years before Jesus Christ was born. Isaiah said, behold, a virgin will, a virgin will conceive. He said that it will occur in the, and that this will occur in Bethlehem of Judea some 700 years ago. He indicated that this was going to happen. And when Isaiah spoke, the clock began to tick. The clock began to tick. And from that time on, as, as, the, as the event began, became clearer and, and as the event got nearer, God intervened in, new, in numerous ways into world history. And I would like to just point out to you a couple of them. In the fullness of time, God sent his son to redeem the world. What, how did God intervene? What did he do to make preparation for that? Well, all of us, I think, have heard of Alexander the Great. He was a young Greek monarch, just a young man, probably 30, 32 years old, 33 years old. He, through his military and their might, he, uh, he conquered what was known as the, as the ancient world. One record says that when he was about 33 and all of the nations that he, all the nations that he knew about had been conquered, that he actually sat down and wept because there were no more worlds for him to conquer. But what did he have to do with the fullness of time? What did he have to do with the coming of Jesus Christ? Alexander the Great had a language. His people had a language, the Greek Koine language, Greek language, is a precise language. It is perhaps, you know, if it's written per precisely, translated precisely, and understood as it should be, it is probably the most precise language known to man. And what did that have to do with Jesus Christ? Well, years later, the message of his salvation was, was presented to the entire world because Alexander's in, in, injection of his language into the world made it possible. And people all around the world understood it. They knew it. They spoke it. They understood it. And the gospel was proclaimed. Even to this day, his language is studied. I hated Greek when I was in college, Bible college, but I had to study it. Even to this day, Alexander the Great's language is studied because when you understand God's word and you're able to read it and understand it and translate it, it speaks to your heart in a, in a very precise, in a very particular way. After his death, a number of years transpired. His four of his generals divided up the kingdom as that he had conquered. And in a period of years, then Rome came on the scene. Rome, with its might and its military, they brought law and order to the, to the ancient world. They built roads. 
that in fact in some parts of the world you can in 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 the, in the world in Europe you can drive on roads that Rome built. Rome also issued a a universal to them to those they wished citizenship which gave you protection wherever you went. It was the apostle Paul who took advantage of that Roman citizenship. It made possible for men to travel. It made possible for the gospel to go forward. The gospel of grace and of mercy and the good news that Jesus Christ was born and died and rose again and sits at the right hand of the Father and is the intercessor on our behalf. In the fullness of time, God intercede. God was in charge. He was in control of the whole, of the whole situation. In the fullness of time, God sent his son, and today we sitting in this room are the recipients of that action on the part of God interjecting himself into history in preparation for the coming of Jesus Christ. The second thing that I would have you take note of, the purpose of the Bethlehem event, is found in the first half of verse 5. God sent his son, but to what purpose? To redeem those under law. What law, Paul? The law of sin and death. Jesus Christ came, the perfect Son of God who lived before the beginning of time in perfect harmony with the Father, came and brought peace and hope and joy into the lives of those who will believe and will trust him, who will rely on him. The law of sin and death says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And he came, Jesus came to redeem and to give life to those who will trust him. And the third purpose for the Bethlehem event is found in that same sentence. The son came not only to redeem, but that we might receive the full rights of sons. Paul beautifully puts it together. Now that we are in relationship with God, now that we have a relationship with the father through the son, we are able to cry out, Abba. Abba. Abba is an Aramaic word that mean, literally means daddy. But it's translated father. Because of our relationship with God, we have been redeemed through the blood of Jesus Christ. We are able to enter a, into a personal relationship with God. And that could not possibly have happened if it were not for the fact that we were adopted into his family. Redeemed, given rights as sons, adopted into the family of God. As I was working on this message last week, it occurred to me that as far as I know, no one in my family has uh, ever been adopted or adopted someone into the family, so I, I hadn't given it a lot of thought. But I would imagine that if, apart from a, a, an infant, a small child, uh, if someone were, were adopted into a family that was old enough to begin to consider, how am I going to fit into that family? Am, am, am I going to fit? Will they accept me? Will I really become a part of them? How am I to conduct myself? How are they going to react to me? We've all heard the horror stories of how some children who, are, who have been greatly abused, that, they, that they, had a, they have a difficult time adjusting into new families. But because of Jesus Christ, we are adopted into God's family, and we have some instructions on how, at least I think we have some instructions on how we are to adjust into that family. The scripture tells us Jesus gives us some insight into how we are to react and to adjust into an adopted family. Jesus was obedient to the Father. He was obedient to death, even the death of the cross. He was obedient, and I, and I would think that one of the things that we need to do as adopted sons and daughters into God's family is learn to be obedient to him. He says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And I'm not going to go where my, I would, no, I won't, I won't go there. I'm going to say about my son, but I, I won't go there. He's bigger than I am now. <laughs> but Jesus was obedient. He was obedient to the Father. And also the scripture tells us, that, that he was meek and lonely of heart. Now in Greek literature, it's interesting. Meek, we don't speak about meekness very much. But in Greek literature, Greek meekness describes strength under control. And the picture that they have in their mind when they say that is the, is the bringing a, a wild horse under control. You don't break its spirit, you don't injure it in some way, but you bring it under control so that, so that its strength and energies can be used in a productive way. 
God wants us to take our energies, our strength, our talents, our skills, and submit them to him, bring them under his control for his honor and his glory. He doesn't take them away from us, but he wants us to use them for his glory. And the word lowliness or humbleness of heart describes taking a lowly posture, a lowly posture, laying aside our pride, laying aside our arrogance, taking the role of a willing servant of God. We celebrate Christmas, and uh, we have the crash here of Mary and Joseph. And I don't know if we think very often of the pressures that those two people underwent when it was found that Mary was, was with, with child. They lived in a culture and a time that there was very little tolerance for, for uh, stepping outside the boundaries. There was, there was almost no tolerance for that. Can you imagine the, the, the family, the social pressures that they, must have fa- that they must have felt? But Mary said, "Whatever you de- what it, let it be. Whatever you decide, I, I, I'm willing. And Joseph was told, that which was of, is with Mary is of the Holy Spirit. Take, don't be afraid to take her ever, uh, as your wife. They took the lowly, the humble position. They took the humble heart and they were obedient to the Lord. So I guess what I'm trying to say to you this morning is this. The next few hours we're going to be saying Merry Christmas and we're going to sit down to meals and we're going to, we're going to open Christmas cards and presents and it's going, to be a, it's going to be a fun time, and especially if there's little kids around. It's going to be a, it's going to be a great time, but, but let, let, us, let us not forget, but let us ponder for at least a few moments the fact that the whole, the whole story is with re- the whole story has to do with God's redemption of mankind. That's what the story is about: is salvation and forgiveness and grace that that unregenerated man does not deserve. But because of Christ and our and our trusting in Him, we are able to have peace of heart and mind. And secondly, I think we can validate our testimony, and this is important: that we validate our testimony with meekness and humility as a hallmark of our life. It's one thing to declare, you know, that I'm a Christian, but if we're proud and arrogant and we cheat at golf and at playing cards, (laughs) someone said he's meddling now. (laughs) He's meddling now. But let humility and gentleness of heart be validated in our lives so that when we say that we're a Christian and that we love Jesus Christ and that, he, that he's our savior, that those around us will not roll their eyes and say, well, yeah, that's, that's that, you know. God sent his son to redeem and to make us sons and daughters of God and to make us members of the family, members of the family. What a, what a great, what a great concept. Remember that this day and tomorrow, would you please? And may I say to you all, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. God bless you.